I am Jim Anderton, Director of Content here at Engineering.com. I'm here at the Canadian Manufacturing Technology Show 2015, and I'm with Mark Kirby, the Additive Manufacturing Business Manager for Renishaw Canada. You know, there are a lot of buzzwords surrounding additive manufacturing, 3D printing. The terminology, it, it fl flies fast and furious. But what's the truth? And to cut through some of that, those buzzwords, Mark is something of an expert. And Mark, can you tell me exactly what is it about additive manufacturing, that, the, the confusion? How can we cut through that? How can we truly understand what we're looking at? Okay, well, one of, the, one of the terms that people use a lot is parts consolidation, and that's kind of a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? Parts consolidation, what does that mean? And, and why would that be good for anybody? So what I've got here is an example. It's a generic example, it's not real, but it's a satellite uh, waveguide device, a, a microwave device, which would typically be made as a series of modules and bolted together. And when we weigh this component, it winds up coming out at about 130 grams. And each of these interfaces here is a potential failure mode. So rather than building it as a series of individual pieces, could I just print this in one? That would be parts consolidation. So here's one I prepared earlier. So this has been 3D printed. So I don't know if you want to actually take a guess, Jim, but how many pieces do you think I have consolidated into this one single piece? Well, at first glance, looking at that, I would guess if we include the fasteners, uh, perhaps 35 pieces? Okay, the answer is actually 77 pieces. And, and you're right, a lot of them are fasteners, uh, but we've got one, two, three, four, five lumps of metal that have been printed, printed as one, and all of these interfaces now are no longer exist in terms of failure modes uh, and losses. So this would seem to be a very compelling case. So this is parts consolidation in action. Now, why don't we see this in space? So launching things into space costs a lot of money, so it's maybe $10,000 a kilogram to launch something into space. So I can save quite a lot of weight here, but it's also a very um, demanding environment space. So what if something goes wrong? But we're engineers, so we can analyze this part. We can analyze its performance electrically and mechanically. And that's what we need to do in order to see these kind of parts fly in space. And I believe we will see them soon. Just as composites had tremendous promise, they also had problems. Everyone was very afraid. What happens if there's damage underneath the skin of a composite? And yet we fly on aircraft every day now that have composite wings. So there was enough promise for us to solve those problems. And the same is true with additive. We will solve these questions. They're not big enough barriers for us not to adopt. So you can expect parts like this to be flying in satellites soon. Now, Mark, in, uh, those of us who have experienced in powder metallurgy, for example, or in sintering processes, uh, think about porosity, density. Now, an additive manufactured part such as this, does it behave in the same way as a single piece of bulk material? First of all, it should be it should be fully dense. There's a lot of mythology about porosity and, you know, is this going to be full of holes? No, it's not going to be. It would be no good if it was full of holes. So these parts should be 99, you know, for aerospace parts, we'd be looking at density that's 99.9 .9 and several more decimal places in terms of density. Mark, would you fly on a spacecraft or an aircraft which extensively made with additive manufacturing technology? <laughs> Absolutely, Jim. I would, I would fly and I would put my family on that uh, tomorrow, if we could have such a... And I li I'd like to think that these things will happen in our lifetimes. Expert confidence in the future of additive manufacturing and critical applications.